and welcome to my show on civil rights. My name is Barbara Bullen and I'm one of the radio hosts for the New Heights Show on Education and the New Heights Educational Group. I hope you enjoy the show and I'm asking our listeners to consider becoming a sponsor. This show is pre-recorded. This show is based on the life of Frederick Douglass, taken from en.wikipedia.org. After Lincoln's death, the post-war ratification of the 13th Amendment on December the 6th, 1865, outlawed slavery, except as a punishment for crime. The 14th Amendment provided for birthright citizenship and prohibited the states from abridging the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States or denying any person due process of law or equal protection of the laws. The 15th Amendment protected all citizens from being discriminated against in voting because of race. After Lincoln had been assassinated, Douglas conferred with President Andrew Johnson on the subject of black suffrage. On April 14, 1876, Douglas delivered the keynote speech at the unveiling of the Emancipation Memorial in Washington's Lincoln Park. He spoke frankly about Lincoln, noting what he perceived as both positive and negative attributes of the late president. Calling Lincoln the white man's president, Douglas criticized Lincoln's tardiness in joining the cause of emancipation noting that Lincoln initially opposed the expansion of slavery, but did not support its elimination. But Douglas also asked, can any colored man or any white man friendly to the freedom of all men ever forget the night which followed the first day of January, 1863, when the world was to see if Abraham Lincoln would prove to be as good as his word. He also said, Though Mr. Lincoln shared the prejudices of his white fellow countrymen against the Negro, it is hardly necessary to say that in his heart of hearts he loathed and hated slavery. Most famously, he added, viewed from the genuine abolition ground, Mr. Lincoln seemed tardy, cold, dull, and indifferent. But measuring him by the sentiment of his country, a sentiment he was bound as a statesman to consult, he was swift, zealous, radical, and determined. The crowd roused by his speech gave Douglas a standing ovation. Lincoln's widow, Mary Lincoln, supposedly gave Lincoln's favorite walking stick to Douglas in appreciation. That walking stick still rests in his final residence, Cedar Hill, now preserved as a Frederick Douglass National Historic Site. After delivering the speech, Frederick Douglass immediately wrote to the National Republican newspaper in Washington, which published five days later, April 19th, criticizing the statute's design and suggesting the park could be improved by more dignified monuments of free black people. The Negro here, though rising, is still on his knees and nude, Douglass wrote. What I want to see before I die is a monument representing the, the Negro, not cochant on his knees like a four-footed animal, but erect on his feet like a man. After the Civil War, Douglas continued to, walk, to work for equality for African Americans and women. Due to his prominence and activism during the war, Douglas received several political appointments. He served as president of the Reconstruction Era, Freedmen's Savings Bank. Meanwhile, white insurgents had quickly arisen in the South after the war, organizing first a secret vigilante groups, including the Ku Klux Klan. Armed insurgency took different forms. Powerful paramilitary groups, including the White League and the Red Shirts, both active during the 1870s in the Deep South. They operated as the military arm of the Democratic Party turning out Republican office holders and disrupting elections. Starting 10 years after the war, Democrats regained political power in every state of the former Confederacy 
began to reassert white supremacy. They enforced this by a combination of violence. Late 19th century laws imposing segregation and a concerted effort to disfranchise African Americans, new labor and criminal laws also limited their freedom. To combat these efforts, Douglas supported the presidential campaign of Ulysses S. Grant in 1868. In 1870, Douglas started his last newspaper, The New National Era, attempting to hold his country to its commitment to equality. President Grant sent a congressionally sponsored commission accompanied by Douglas on a mission to the West Indies to investigate whether the annexation of Santo Domingo would be good for the United States. Grant believed annexation would help relieve the violent situation in the South by allowing African Americans their own state. Douglas and the commission favored annexation, but Congress remained opposed to annexation. Douglas criticized Senator Charles Sumner, who opposed annexation, stating that if Sumner continued to oppose annexation, he would regard him as the worst foe the colored race has on this con continent. After the midterm elections, Grant signed the Civil Rights Act of 1871, also known as the Klan Act, and the Second and Third Enforcement Acts. Grant used their provisions vigorously, suspending habeas corpus in South Carolina and sending troops there and into other states. Under his leadership, over 5,000 arrests were made. Grant's figure in disrupting the Klan made him unpopular among many whites, but earned praise from Douglas. A Douglas associate wrote that African Americans will ever cherish a grateful remembrance of Grant's name, fame, and great services. In 1872, Douglas became the first African American nominated for Vice President of the United States as Victoria Woodhull's running mate on the Equal Rights Party ticket. He was nominated without his knowledge. Douglas neither campaigned for the ticket nor acknowledged that he had been nominated. In that year, he was presidential elector at large for the state of New York and took that state's votes to Washington, D.C. However, in early June of that year, Douglas's third Rochester home on South Avenue, Avenue burned down. Arson was suspected. There was extensive damage to the house, its furnishings, and the grounds. In addition, 16 volumes of the North Star and Frederick Douglass paper were lost. Douglas then moved to Washington, D.C. Throughout the Reconstruction era, Douglas continued speaking emphasizing the importance of work, voting rights, and actual exercise of suffrage. His speeches for the 25 years following the war emphasized work to counter the racism that was then prevalent in unions. In a November 15, 1867 speech, he said, A man's rights rest in three boxes, the ballot box, jury box, and the cartridge box. Let no man be kept from the ballot box because of his color. Let no woman be kept from the ballot box because of her sex. Douglas spoke at many colleges around the country, including Bates College in Lewiston, Maine in 1873. In 1881, Douglas delivered at Store College in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, a speech praising John Brown and revealing unknown information about their relationship, including their meeting in an abandoned stone quarry near Cham. Brisburg shortly before the raid. Douglas and Anna Murray had five children. Rosetta Douglas, Louis Henry Douglas, Frederick Douglas Jr., Charles Rewin Douglas, and Annie Douglas, who died at the age of 10. Charles and Rosetta helped produce his newspapers. Anna Douglas remained a loyal supporter of her husband's public work. His relationships with Julia Griffiths and Otto Tilly Assing, two women with whom he was professionally involved, caused recurring speculation and scandals. Assing was a journalist recently immigrated from Germany who first visited Douglas in 1856, seeking permission to translate My Bondage and My Freedom into German. Until 1872, she often stayed at his house 
for several months at a time as his intellectual and emotional companion. As Singh held Anna Douglas in utter contempt and was vainly hoping that Douglas would separate from his wife, Douglas biography, biographer David W. Blight concludes that Assing and Douglas were probably lovers, though Douglas and, uh, and Assing are widely believed to have had an intimate relationship. The surviving correspondence contains no proof of such a relationship. After Anna died in 1882, in 1884 Douglas was married again to Helen Pitts, a white suffrage and an abolitionist from Honeyai, New York. Pitts was the daughter of Gideon Pitts Jr., an abolitionist colleague and friend of Douglas's. A graduate of Mount Holyoke College, then called Mount Holyoke Female Seminary, Pitts worked on a radical feminist publication named Alpha while living in Washington, Washington D.C. She later worked as Douglas's secretary. A Singh, who had depression and was diagnosed with incurable breast cancer, committed suicide in France in 1884 after hearing of the marriage. Upon her death, A Singh bequeathed Douglas a $13,000 trust fund, a large album, and his choice of books from her library. The marriage of Douglas and Pitts provoked a storm of controversy, since Pitts was both white and nearly 20 years younger. Her family stopped speaking to her. her ch his children considered the marriage a, a, a repudiation of their mo mother, but feminist Elizabeth Cady Stanton congratulated the couple. Douglas responded to the criticism by saying that his first marriage had been to someone the color of his mother and his second to someone the color of his father. Right now, you might be struggling through your classes or even failing them. You might be worried that you may not finish high school. There might have even been a thought that you may not be smart enough. Well, the New Heights Educational Group begs to differ. We not only think you are smart enough, but with our help, you will complete your high school diploma. The New Heights Educational Group strives to improve your academic success through its tutoring services. To learn more, please visit newheightseducation.org and contact us. New Heights Educational Group educational resources to help reach your goals hello listeners if you're enjoying the new heights show on education and want to support or donate to our organization please visit www.newheightseducation.org and while you're there check out our online store Welcome back to the New Heights Show on Education. My name is Barbara Bullen and I'm the radio host for this show. This show is pre-recorded and focuses on the history of civil rights. A recap of the first segment of the show on Frederick Douglass will continue. Final Years in Washington, D.C. The Freedmen's Savings Bank went bankrupt on June the 29th 1874, just a few months after Douglas became its president in late March. During that same economic crisis, his final newspaper, The New National Era, failed in September. When Republican Rutherford B. Hayes was elected president, he named Douglas as United States Marshal for the District of Columbia, the first person of color to be so named. The Senate voted to confirm him on March 17, 1877. Douglas accepted the appointment, which helped to show his family's financial security. During his tenure, Douglas was urged by his supporters to resign from his commission since he was never asked to introduce visiting foreign dignitaries to the president, which is one of the usual duties of that post. However, Douglas believed that no covert racism was implied by the omission and stated that he was always warmly welcomed in presidential circles. In 1877, Douglas visited his former slave master, Thomas Old, on his deathbed, and the two men reconciled. Douglas had met Old's daughter, Amanda Old Sears, some years prior. She had requested the meeting and had subsequently attended and chaired one of Douglas's speeches 
Her father complimented her for reaching out to Douglas. The visit also appears to have brought clo closure to Douglas, although some criticized his effort. That same year, Douglas bought the house that was to be the family's final home in Washington, D.C., on a hill above the Anacostia River. He and Anna named it Cedar Hill, also spelled Cedar Hill. They expanded the house from 14 to 21 rooms and included a china closet. One year later, Douglas purchased adjoining lots and expanded the property to 15 acres. The home is now preserved as the Frederick Douglass National Historic Site. In 1881, Douglas published the final edition of his autobiography, The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. That year, he was appointed as Recorder of Deeds for the District of Columbia. His wife, Anna Murray Douglas, died in 1882, leaving the widower devastated. After a period of mourning, Douglas found new meaning from working with activist Ida B. Wells. He remarried in 1884, as mentioned above. Douglas also continued his speaking engagements and travel, both in the United States and abroad. With new wife Helen, Douglas traveled to England, Ireland, France, Italy, Egypt, and Greece from 1886 to 1887. He became known for advocating Irish home rule and supported Charles Stuart Parnell in Ireland. At the 1888 Republican National Convention, Douglas became the first African American to receive a vote for President of the United States in a major party's roll call vote. That year, Douglas spoke at Claflin College, a historically black college in Orangeburg, South Carolina, and the state's oldest such institution. Many African Americans called Exodusters escaped the Klan and racially discriminatory laws in the South by moving to Kansas where some formed all black towns to have a greater level of freedom and autonomy. Douglas did not favor this, nor the Back to Africa movement. He thought the latter resembled the American Colonization Society, which he had opposed in his youth. In 1892, at an Indianapolis conference convened by Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, Douglas spoke out against the separatist movements, urging blacks to stick it out. He made similar speeches as early as 1879 and was criticized both by fellow leaders and some audiences who even booed him for this position. Speaking in Baltimore in 1894, Douglas said, I hope and trust all will come out right in the end, but the immediate future looks dark and troubled. I cannot shut my eyes to the ugly facts before me. President Harrison appointed Douglas as United States Minister Resident and, cons and Consul General to the Republic of Haiti and charged their affairs for Santo Domingo in 1889, but Douglas resigned the commission in July 1891 when it became apparent that the American president was intent upon gaining permanent access to Haitian territory regardless of that country's desires. In 1892, Haiti made Douglas a co-commissioner of its pavilion at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. In 1892, Douglas constructed rental housing for blacks, now known as Douglas Place, in the Fells Point area of Baltimore. The complex, complex still exists and in 2003 was listed on the National Registry of Historic Places. On February the 20th, 1895, Douglas attended a meeting of the National Council of Women in Washington, D.C. During that meeting, he was brought to the platform and received a standing ovation. Shortly after he returned home, Douglas died of a massive heart attack. He was 77. His funeral was held at the Metropolitan African Methodist Episcopal Church. Although Douglas had attended several churches in the nation's capital, he had a pew here and had donated two standard standing candelabras when this church had moved to a new building in 1886. He also gave many lectures there, including his last major speech, The Lesson of the Hour. 
Thousands of people passed by his coffin to show their respect. United States Senators and Supreme Court Judges were Paul Bearers. Jeremiah Ranking, President of Howard University, delivered a masterly address. A letter from Elizabeth Cady Stanton was read. The Secretary of the Haitian Legation expressed a con con condolence of his country in melodious French. Douglas's coffin was transported to Rochester, New York, where he had lived for 25 years, longer than anywhere else in his life. His body was received in state at City Hall, flags were flown at half-mast, and schools adjourned. He was buried next to Anna in the Douglas family plot of Mount Hope Cemetery, Rochester's premier memorial park. Helen was also buried there in 1903. His grave is, with that of Susan B. Anthony, the most visited in the cemetery. A marker erected by the University of Rochester and other friends describes him as escaped slave, abolitionist, suffragist, journalist, and statesman, founder of the civil rights movement in America. Frederick Douglass wrote three autobiographies. The first is Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, taken from en.wikipedia.org. Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass is an 1845 memoir and treatise on abolition written by famous orator and former slave Frederick Douglass during his time in Lynn, Massachusetts. It is generally held to be the most famous of a number of narratives written by former slaves during the same period. In factual detail, the text describes the events of his life and is considered to be one of the most influential pieces of literature to fuel the abolitionist movement of the early 19th century in the United States. Narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass encompasses 11 chapters that recount Douglass's life as a slave and his ambition to become a free man. It contains two introductions by well-known white abolitionists, prefaced by William Lloyd Garrison, and a letter by Wendell Phillips, both arguing for the veracity of the account and the literacy of its author. Chapters 1-4 to four. Douglas begins by explaining that he does not know the date of his birth. He later chose February the 14th, 1818, and that his mother died when he was seven years old. He has very few memories of her, as children were commonly separated from their mothers, only of the rare nighttime visit. He thinks his father is a white man, possibly his owner. At a very early age, he sees his aunt Hester being whipped. Douglas Root details the cruel interaction that occurs between slaves and slaveholders, as well as how slaves are supposed to behave in the presence of their masters. Douglas says that fear is what kept many slaves in forced servitude, for when they told the truth, they were punished by their owners. Chapters 5 to 7. At this point in the narrative, Douglas has moved to Baltimore, Maryland. This move is rather important for him because he believes that if he had not been moved, he would have remained a slave his entire life. He even starts to have hope for a better life in the future. He also discusses his new mistress, Mrs. Sophia Ald who begins as a very kind woman, but eventually turns cruel. Douglas learns the alphabet and how to spell small words from this woman, but her husband, Mr. Ald, disapproves and states that if slaves could read, they would not be fit to be slaves, being unmanageable and sad. Upon hearing why Mr. Ald disapproves of slaves being taught how to read, Douglas realizes the importance of reading and the possibilities that this skill could help him. He takes it upon himself to learn how to read and learn all he can, but at times this newfound skill torments him. Douglas then gains an understanding of the word abolition and develops the idea to run away to the north. He also learns how to write and how to read well. Chapters 8-9 to nine. At the age of 10 or 11, Douglas' master dies and his property is left to be divided between the master's son and daughter. The slaves are valued along with the livestock, causing Douglas to develop a new hatred of slavery. He feels lucky when he is sent back to Baltimore to live with the family of Master Hugh. He is then moved through a few situations before he is sent to St. Michael's. 
His regret at not having attempted to run away is evident, but on his voyage he makes a mental note that he travelled in the north-easterly direction and considers this information to be of extreme importance. For some time he lives with Master Thomas Auld, who is particularly cruel, even after attending a Methodist camp. Douglas is pleased when he, when he eventually is lent to Mr. Covey for a year, simply because he would be fed. Mr. Covey is known as a Negro breaker who breaks the will of slaves. Chapters 10 to 11. While under the control of Mr. Covey, Douglas is a field hand and has an especially hard time at the task required of him. He is harshly whipped almost on a weekly basis, apparently due to his awkwardness. He is worked and beaten to exhaustion, which finally causes him to collapse one day while working in the fields. Because of this, he is brutally beaten once more by Covey. Douglas eventually complains to Thomas Auld, who subsequently sends him back to Covey. A few days later, Covey attempts to tie up Douglas, but he fights back. After a two-hour-long physical battle, Douglas ultimately conquers Covey. After this fight, he is never beaten again. Douglas is not punished by the law, which is believed to be due to the fact that Covey cherishes his reputation as a Negro breaker, which would be jeopardized if others knew what happened. When his one-year contract ends under Covey, Douglas is sent to live on William Freeland's plantation. Douglas comments on the abuse suffered under Covey, a religious man, and the relative peace under the more favorable but more secular Freeland. On Freeland's plantation, Douglas befriends other slaves and teaches them how to read. Douglas and a small group of slaves make a plan to escape, but before doing so, they are caught and Douglas is put in jail. Following his, following his release about a week later, he is sent to Baltimore once more, but it's time to learn a trade. He becomes an apprentice in a shipyard under Mr. Gardner, where he is disliked by several white apprentices due to his slave status and race. At one point, he gets into a fight with them and they nearly gouge out his left eye. Woefully beaten, Douglas goes to Master Hugh, who is kind, regarding the situation and refuses to let Douglas return to the shipyard. Master Hugh tries to find a lawyer, but all will refuse, saying they can only do something for a white person. Sophia Auld, who had turned cruel under the influence of slavery, feels pity for Douglas and tends to the wound at his left eye until he is healed. At this point, Douglas is employed as a caulker and receives wages, but is forced to give every cent to Master Auld in due time. Douglas eventually finds his own job and plans the date in which he will escape to the north. He succeeds in reaching New Bedford but does not give details of how he does so in order to protect those who help him to allow the possibility for other slaves to escape by similar means. Douglas unites with his fiancée and begins working as his own master. He attends an anti-slavery convention and eventually becomes a well-known orator and abolitionist. This comes to the conclusion of the show. Next week's show will continue on the autobiographies and life of Frederick Douglass. Thank you for listening. You can reach me by email barbara b at newheightseducation.org. Be sure to join me every Sunday at radio.newheightseducation.org, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, as I discuss the history of civil rights. Also join Pamela Clark's pre recorded shows, which airs Wednesday by 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Civil rights is our right. Have a great week. We hope you enjoyed today's show. Don't forget to rate us and follow us on your podcast player. Check out our show page, radio.newheightseducation.org, for monthly announcements and other happenings.